Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar series two of this webinar series. There's two more to follow. Please stay along, tune in for the next ones. So starting off, I'd like to go over some housekeeping. Um, all participants are muted during this presentation. For technical issues, please use the chat function. For any questions, can be submitted through the chat test question box function as well. Um, and a recording of this webinar will be sent out to all registrants within 24 hours after the webinar is finished. If you did not get this a copy of it, you can always reach out to us at events at eco .a and I can send that along. The traditional land acknowledgement. Eco Canada and myself would like, would like to recognize today and every day the land we are on. Eco Canada's commitment to reconciliation starts with acknowledging our honor and privilege to work and live within this Indigenous territory. Eco Canada acknowledges the traditional territories and oral practices of these Indigenous nations. A little bit about Eco, who we are. Eco Canada is a steward of Eco Canada is a steward for the Canadian environmental workforce across all industries. We champion the end-to-end -end career of an environmental professional. We not only train and certify professionals, but we also help identify and address labor market gaps. Our efforts to promote and drive responsible, sustainable economic growth to ensure that environmental care and best practices are a priority. And hand it off to Stephanie. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, thanks, Chase, so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Stephanie Forbes. Uh, today, I would like to chat with you guys about the greenhouse gas uh, protocols, and we're going to dive into a little bit more detail around scope three. So, specifically, we're going to start off in the introduction. Next slide, Chase. Thanks. So, the greenhouse gas protocol serves as a globally recognized accounting tool for measuring and managing greenhouse gas or GHG emissions. This has been developed by the World Resources Institute, or WRI, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the WBCSD. The protocol is widely adopted as the standard framework and considered best in class for organizations to assess and report on their carbon footprint. It's comprised of three scopes. Scope one involves direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. Scope two addresses indirect emissions from purchased energy. And scope three expands to the focus to indirect emissions across the entire supply chain, including suppliers, customers. Together, these scopes provide a comprehensive approach to understanding and mitigating GHG impacts. So we're gonna do just a quick brief overview of scope one. So the definition of scope one is direct emissions from sources that are owned or controlled by the organization. An example here would include the combustion of fossil fuels in owned facilities, on-site transportation and process emissions. So scope one is significant in that it lies in its direct connection to an organization's operation, making it a focal point for immediate action. By monitoring and reducing scope one emissions, companies can enhance operational efficiency, lower energy costs, and contribute to the overall environmental sustainability. Scope two is defined as indirect emissions resulting from the generation of purchased electricity, such as heat, um, electricity from like an NMAX or a Fortis. Um, so again, those are purchased um, from an external source. The significance here is that scope two emissions involves a strategic decision around energy procurement. Who you source it from? Are they renewable? Do they have any renewable platforms? And are they, um, pardon me, investing in energy efficient technologies? So scope three, which is where we're gonna spend most of our time today, is the indirect emissions that occur throughout an entire value chain of the organization, including both up and downstream activities. Scope three is divided into 15 categories covering a wide range of activities, and I'll provide a brief overview of each. The significance of scope three is that they are often the largest and most challenging category to address. They extend beyond an organization's direct control, requiring collaboration with suppliers, customers, and other stakeholders to effectively manage and reduce emissions. Examples here are going to include everything from the production of raw materials, transportation of products, and use of products, and disposal of waste. I'll um, fall under with uh, under scope three. So here, this is where you have strategies that an organization can adopt. So sustainable product design, energy efficient transportation, waste reduction initiatives, and collaborative efforts with suppliers. 
So the important piece here is that scope three as in addressing scope three emissions is crucial for a holistic approach to sustainability. It considers the full life cycle of products and services, and it also demonstrates an organization's commitment to reducing their environmental impacts and to engage with their entire supply chain to achieve meaningful results. So let's dive in to um, scope three. And so the first section we're gonna review is the upstream activities. So the upstream activities, and we're gonna start off um, with number one here. And this is where having a supplier lifecycle management plan and criteria is essential for data collection, reporting, and audit. It requires significant cross-functional collaboration, alignment, and decision-making between the functional groups like supply chain, finance, operations, manufacturing, engineering, design. So what we need to do here is establish what the minimum reporting requirements are and how much personnel support and or financial support may be required to bring certain suppliers or other groups along to meet the needs of the organization. So for each of these categories, I'm gonna review the, the overall topic and I'm gonna to reference specifically the stakeholder and the engagement strategy. This is really critical to understanding what the focus is. Some of them are really similar and the only real difference is actually the stakeholder. Um, the stakeholder changes, but overall you're talking almost about the same thing. And so it's important to understand that, that perspective. So under purchase goods and services, your stakeholder is your supplier. So this is who you're buying things from. And this is where on an engagement piece, collaborating with those suppliers to implement sustainable sourcing practices around raw materials, share emissions data, explore opportunities to reduce your carbon footprint within that supply chain of buying those products. Two is capital goods. So these are manufacturers of capital goods. The difference between suppliers and capital goods generally is um, an accounting term. So a capital good is things like a truck and a car, um, maybe a, um, a backhoe or a, um, a large truck that holds dirt or a trailer. Those would be capital goods that may include um, computer equipment from time to time, depending on the threshold. So this is where you wanna work with equipment manufacturers to improve energy efficiency, promote the use of low carbon materials and invest in the development of cleaner technologies. And so you would see that in something like say a, a truck, if you're buying a Ford F-150 and you're gonna get a hybrid, you'd see that you know there's some adoption of some cleaner technologies um, and a lower carbon footprint. Third here is fuel and energy related activities not included in scope one and scope two. So scope one again is, you know, um, you know energy that you produce as, as part of your operations, two, the energy that you purchase. So this one, fuel and energy related activities in upstream might be something like the use of um, an on-site small generator or a light plant and the fuel that goes in that piece of equipment might be a, a fuel and energy related activity, but not one um, at such a large scale as scope one and scope scope two. The next one is transportation and distribution. So number four is uh, where you're really going to engage with your transportation companies. And it's important here to note that this um, is upstream. So this is where you're partnering them to improve your fuel efficiency, explore alternative fuels and modes of transportation as it relates to things that you're purchasing. Um, so this is where you want to make sure that you're using things um, within the technology space and that your transportation company has maybe a third party app or some other tracking device so that they can help uh, provide you some metrics there. Uh, five is waste generated. So this is where you're working with your waste management companies to partner and reduce, reuse and recycle waste, explore innovative waste management um, practices. And this can include everything from waste segregation, on-site recycling to closed loop material systems. So there's a lot of opportunity within the waste generated space for some real efficiencies. Um, six is business travel. And so this one's a bit of a hot topic. So a lot of this would have to be controlled under a government, or sorry, not a government, a company policy around business travel and business travel expectations. So your stakeholder here is your transportation companies um, and your travel agents um, that are providing you with your you know, WestJet plane ticket or your Marriott hotel and working with them to offer sustainable travel options, promote, say, some maybe more virtual meetings instead of traveling and helping also implement, pardon me, carbon offset programs. So the important thing here with the business travel piece is that um, a lot of people really enjoy their business travel. Um, they enjoy the benefits that come with business travel. And so this, you really need to make sure that you have a, 
an organizational um, objective uh, when you start going down um, the business travel portion in your, your GHG protocol. We're gonna move on to number seven now, which is employee commuting. And this is where your local transportation authorities are your stakeholder. So this is collaborating with a municipality such as a, say a city to improve your public transportation options, cycling paths, infrastructure and telecommunicating. So maybe you need fiber optic in your area, maybe you need some additional bandwidth so that you're able to do video conferencing uh, from home. And the whole intent here is to reduce the environmental impact of employee commuting. Uh, number eight here is leased assets. So these are leased assets um, where the lease asset owner or the lessor is the stakeholder. And so this is where you're working with somebody that you're leasing, your company's leasing um, uh, an item from and you're working with the people who own it to say, hey, can we get a better um, heating unit? Can we get some more efficient uh, windows and doors um, and different things like that to optimize and explore um, any opportunities for shared use of assets um, to optimize efficiency and reduce the overall carbon uh, footprint with the least asset. So now we're gonna move on to downstream activities. So downstream activities, um, we're going to see some duplication here and again it's important to really understand that the the stakeholder and the perspective has changed so the first one we're going to start off with is transportation and distribution and because this is downstream um this is this is things that you're selling as an organization it's not things that you're buying and transporting it's things that you're you're selling now in your transportation and distribution so again same stakeholder your, your distribution and logistic partners however it's stuff that you are selling as an organization and this is where you really want to optimize distribution networks improve supply chain visibility and really collaborate on the last mile delivery solutions to reduce emissions associated with product distribution this is where those you know how do you get the last you know 10 things to that person you know way out in the boonies like that that's really where you want to talk about some of those efficiencies and those collaborations um, in that downstream transportation space. Number 10 is the processing of sold products. So 10, 11, and 12 sometimes can be difficult to navigate a little bit because they're very, very similar. So 10, the processing of sold products is where your stakeholders, the manufacturers, or if you say you're making food, the processors of your product, your, you know, your packing facility. And this is where you want to work with them to optimize your production processes, reduce energy use, and then implement circular economy principles to maximize the, um, sorry, pardon me, minimize the environmental impacts of product processing. So it's all also very similar to the use of sold products. However, the use of sold products is your customers are your stakeholder. And this is where you're working on education of your customer on the sustainable use of products, provide guidance on energy efficient practices and offer product disposal and recycling information. A really good example here would be Apple. You know, you're, they'll tell you, you know, best ways to charge your phone or, you know, don't just leave something plugged in forever. You know, you wanna make sure that um, it doesn't just sit on a charger. You wanna make sure that you, you don't let it run the battery dead every time. You wanna make sure, uh, you know, at 20% you plug it back in and then if you're done with it or it doesn't work anymore bring it back into the Apple store they're going to recycle it for you um, so it doesn't go into a landfill so that would be an example of engagement with your customers on the use of sold products um, now we're going to move over to 12 so this is end of life treatment of sold products and this is where your recycling and waste management companies are your uh, stakeholders and this is working with them to figure out how does your design need to be easily disassembled so you can recycle it easier? Um, is there better, more responsible disposal practices that we can encourage people to do as opposed to just you know, throwing it in the landfill? Um, 13 is leased assets. Now this is where you are leasing out an asset. So this is where you are um, wanting to provide guidelines for energy efficient use of your leased assets. Encourage your leasees to adopt sustainable practices and explore um, any circular economy models for any of your leased assets. 14 is franchisees. So this is the operation of a franchisee um, sort of system and, and infrastructure. So a really good example of this would be like McDonald's. And this is where you wanna provide sustainable guidelines for a franchise operations on energy efficient practices. Um, 
and you want to incentivize adoption. So I'm not sure if anyone remembers, but years ago we had uh, the Big Macs came in a styrofoam Big Mac container, and that wasn't super um, wasn't super great for you know landfills or really anyone. And so they came up now with a actual compostable little cardboardy one. And so what happened was uh, McDonald's took away the, that sustainable piece. They said, okay, we're gonna change out this container. We're gonna come up with something that's a better alternative. And they um, required the use of this sustainable practice within the Big Mac container across the franchise network. And now all Big Macs have that compostable um, sort of paper container. So that's just sort of an example there of, of franchisees adopting sustainable practices. Um, now, the last one in downstream activities, which is 15, is investments. And this is where your investors and financial institutions are your key stakeholders. Um, this is where you want to communicate your commitment to your sustainability um, programs and share your emission reduction goals and work with either your investors or your other financial strategists to align with your environmental objectives. And so just really keeping in mind here that effective engagement involves collaboration, clear communication, and setting shared goals uh, with your stakeholders throughout the supply chain within each of those share stakeholder groups that we just talked about. Now we're gonna move into, now that we've kind of talked about each of the 15 um, actual categories in scope three, we're gonna talk about um, activities for impact and resource allocation. So we, we kind of know our topics, but now we want to figure out what activities and order of impact is a crucial step for prioritizing an organization's efforts. So some of these tools and methodologies can help flush out how we're going to do that within an organization. So we're going to go through about eight different ranking tools and methodologies here. The first one is a life cycle assessment or LCA. So this is a really systematic tool for evaluating the environmental impacts of a product process or service throughout uh, a life cycle. It can help identify hotspots uh, and quantify emissions associated with different stages, uh, guiding organizations to prioritize impactful activities within their value chain. So an example here would be an oil and gas exploration company uh, conducts a comprehensive LCA for one of its major drilling projects. The assessment expands beyond exploration, drilling, extraction, transportation, refining, and end use phases. The LCA might reveal that significant portions of the environmental impact is associated with extraction, say, and transportation. In response to that, the company might go and say, hey, we're going to advance in some new innovative drilling um, technologies to reduce energy consumption, and we're going to explore some alternative transportation methods. Maybe we're going to do some pipeline optimizations um, to reduce our carbon footprint of truck transport. The next one here is environmental product declarations or EPDs. So they provide a transparent standardized format about the environmental impacts of products. By analyzing EPDs for purchased goods and services, organizations can identify suppliers and products with lower environmental impacts and prioritize them in their procurement. So an example here might be a uh, renewable energy company maybe specializing in wind turbines. And they're going to do an assessment um, on the components such as steel, fiberglass, and electronics. By analyzing the EPD, the company identifies that there are specific suppliers, say for example in electronics, that have a lower carbon footprint for its components. Subsequently, they're going to prioritize that electronics supplier in the procurement process, procure, contributing to a more sustainable uh, life cycle for its wind turbines. The next would be a carbon disclosure project, or CDP. And that is a global disclosure system that enables companies to measure, disclose, manage, and share environmental impact. Um, by participating in it, not only do they gain insights into their own emissions, but they actually get benchmarked um, against their peers for performance. So you get to see where you live within your ecosystem. So an example here might be a multinational retail company uh, participating in CDP to figure out um, you know, the it's raw fabric in its supply chain and how um, environmentally um, friendly versus not friendly it potentially might be. 
And then it can help a company identify key areas for improvement. Say, for example, a specific geographical region is more um, carbon footprint heavy than another one and allow them to set the mission reduction targets and then compare those performance targets uh, globally um, as well as within their own, their own organization. Uh, the next one would be supply chain sustainability software. So various tools, as we're, I'm sure, all aware with the advent of um, more AI and some chat GPT, but there's tons of tools available that specialize in assessing and managing the sustainability of supply chains. These tools often include features for calculating carbon footprints, identifying high impact suppliers and tracking progress over time. So a really good example here, and it's been used actually for quite some time, take a food and beverage company that is going to implement a supply chain sustainability software that tracks sugar suppliers. And it's going to identify high impact suppliers um, and say, okay, you know, these, these two are really high impact from a, a carbon footprint. We need to figure out what we want to do here. And then maybe that large food and beverage company works really closely with one or two key suppliers to help them improve their efficiencies, their footprint, track and monitor, um, you know, those reductions to reduce the overall emission profile within their supply chain. Uh, the next is an input-output analysis, which is an economic modeling technique that traces the flow of goods and services through an economy. It can be used to estimate the indirect emissions associated with different sectors, helping organizations understand the broader impacts of their initiatives. An example here it would be like a chemical manufacturing company using the input-output analysis to assess indirect emissions associated with a specific chemical production process. An analysis would likely reveal that an emission comes from an upstream supplier um, and that they would need to then implement greener practices with that upstream supplier to reduce overall uh, emissions within that um, chemical process. Sector specific guidelines. Some industries have developed really specific guidelines or tools tailored for their emissions programs. A really great example here is the Sustainable Coalitions. Uh, HIG index, which provides a really great framework for measuring and managing the environmental and social impacts of apparel and footwear products. So, uh, you know, top end fashion brands would um, largely want to adopt uh, the HIG index um, and measure and manage the environmental and social, major social considerations of its clothing products. And then the brand will also use the index to assess and improve the sustainability of raw material sourcing from manufacturing to distribution. So um, that's a really specific um, sector guideline, but it is actually quite excellent and, and has produced a lot of um, really great programs, um, especially in places like Bangladesh, um, where there was a, a number of very serious incidents with people um, in facilities uh, sewing clothes. Um, and so that HIG index has been, been really effective in, in helping mitigate some, some problems there. Eco-efficiency analysis, or EEA, is a methodology that combines economic and environmental analysis to evaluate the efficiency of a product or process. So this can be used to identify opportunities for reducing environmental impacts while maintaining or improving economic performance. So a really great example here would be a pharmaceutical company is going to do an EEA on one of its key drugs and it realizes that when it puts all of its drugs in one of those little puffy packs and it's individualized, um, it's really costly to ship. Um, it's you know really difficult um, if there's any quality programs or problems to to adjust because it's it's such a big manufacturing run. And so it decides it's going to take them out of the bubble packs and put them in a different format. Um, and as a result, you have a more eco-efficient um, pharmaceutical product. It still maintains its quality um, and they can manage um, a, lot, um, a lot more of their production and transportation problems that they were having from an energy efficiency perspective a lot more efficiently. The last one we're going to talk about here um, in tools and methodologies is customized modeling. Um, so this is where you have a really bespoke tool that you are going to use with your um, consultants, um, your supply chain, um, and any other dynamics to really produce a, a very custom uh, program. A really great example here would be like an aerospace manufacturer, like a Lockheed Martin. Um, where they're going to create a completely customized model to assess the sustainability of its supply chain. 
And that model is going to consider all the unique challenges and materials involved with their particular aerospace industry. And they're going to provide the company with really tailored insights to make informed decisions about material sourcing, manufacturing processes, and transportation. So you can employ one or a combination of these tools and methodologies. Um, organizations can help gain a nuanced understanding of scope three um, by using any of these tools and methodologies and then that way you can prioritize impactful activities and allocate your resources effectively. So then I would like to move into the systematic approaches to actually implementing these strategies. So this is um, actually where priorities vary wildly uh, based on the nature of the organization, the industry, um, any specific supply chain characteristics. And so following what we just did in assessments and methodologies and tools, now we're gonna sort of identify the best path forward for implementing your strategy. And this could include one or more of the, the following. Um, now the first one we're gonna start off with is stakeholder engagements. And I, anyone on the call is familiar with any change management um, experts, they're probably all like cheering right now. Stakeholder engagement is critical, um, absolutely critical. So this is uh, where all organizational change starts and effective implementations begin. Um, this is where all your external internal stakeholders, so this is your suppliers, your customers, your peers um, are all brought in. This is where you really understand your sustainability goals, you've shared your objectives, explore your opportunities for mutual collaboration and emission reduction efforts. And, and stakeholder engagement is absolutely critical because it'll also tell you if something's not possible. Um, maybe there's some requirement, impediment, regulation, raw material that um, that you need to be aware of and that st stakeholder engagement is going to really flush that out for you. Uh, next one is prioritizing high impact categories. So based on emission intensity significance, you need to consider the emissions associated with purchased goods, services, transportation, and energy in your value chain. So some of these may include like some super low hanging fruit, and those items might be easier to identify and action on than others. Um, a really good example is transportation. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of wiggle room within uh, some of the transportation uh, pieces, you know, if you're dealing with full loads, if you've got, you know, too much airspace within your shipments and, and things like that. So that's a really great place to start. Uh, setting clear reduction targets. So everyone wants to do, okay, we're going to do less. Well, what does less mean? So making sure you establish clear, measurable reduction targets for high priority scope three categories. Ensure those targets are ambitious yet realistic and aligned with overall corporate sustainability goals. Four is going to be supplier engagement and collaboration. So this is where you're going to work closely with your key suppliers to improve transparency and assess um, so they can assess their own emissions. So collaborating on joint in initiatives to reduce emissions such as energy efficiency improvements, sustainable sourcing practices, and transportation optimization. This I've referred to earlier as the supplier life cycle, and you can have in here a pro supplier life cycle management plan. Um, and as you get into like the weeds of you know what you actually are buying and where it's coming from and how many sub suppliers they have, you might want to really consider a comprehensive supplier supplier life cycle management plan. Five, promote sustainable product design. So this is where you want to consider the environmental impact of products throughout their life cycle encouraging sustainable design, reducing materials, making sure it's recyclable or compostable, reviewing your energy intensity to produce it, and maybe even making it more robust or uh, extending the product life. Six, optimizing transportation and logistics. So we've already talked quite a bit about some of these things like the last mile, um, airspace within containers and things like that, uh, route optimization. So really making sure that you're taking a look at those transportation um, goals and objectives. Energy efficiency and renewable energy. So this is where asking groups within your organization or your sub suppliers to take a look at what their energy efficiency is currently and if there's um, ways to uh, reduce that. Eight is waste reduction and circular economy practices. So this is really, really important and that the waste reduction initiatives and circular economy practices really drive how long some of these products, um, you know, stick around for, you know, whether they, they compost, whether they could be fully recycled, partly recycled, and really considering um, how these 
programs and sustainable disposal methods are organized and what your jurisdiction has um, in terms of capacity for those recycling and disposal methodologies. Nine is employee engagement and uh, business travel optimization. So going back to what we talked about within the, the program or policy guidelines within your corporation and figuring out how you want to engage with your employees, what type of travel is going to be required, how much is necessary, and what types of things you want to promote, whether that's remote work options, optimizing business travel, uh, the use of virtual meetings, and, and public transportation. So that really requires a, a proactive approach and really thinking about what the, the overall outcome uh, needs to be first. 10 is investing in innovation and technology. So this is really helping reduce emissions across the value chain. So this includes things like advanced manufacturing process and data analytics for supply chain, um, optimization and digital uh, technologies for remote collaboration. And then lastly, we have track and report progress. So this is where we want to really make sure we have robust monitoring and reporting systems to track progress towards emission reduction goals. This is where we want to regularly communicate challenges to stakeholders and demonstrate your commitment to sustainability. So tracking and reporting progress is often um, sort of seen as we, we have to report progress, but I think it's also important to report whether you're having frustrations or things are difficult or something's not going well or the data is unclear. It's really important in this tracking and reporting progress that you're also really transparent and you identify when things aren't going well as well. Uh, often this tracking and reporting gets a, a bad label of um, you know, greenwashing and not real. And in order for your sustainability initiatives and any of your ESG reporting to be real, we have to be accurate and transparent when we do report. And that includes reporting when things aren't going well. It's just as important as reporting when things are going well. Also, you want to make sure that based on what's happening with your organization, within your jurisdiction and within the globe, that you're going to need to adjust your approach. You will need to be constantly evolving based on circumstances, industry trends and emerging technologies. Often sustainable practices require continuous improvement and adaptation. It's not a one and done. It requires constant uh, revision. So just in summary, um, organizations choose to adopt and implement their GHG protocol voluntarily as part of their commitment to measuring, managing, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, comprehensively. So many companies adopt the GHG protocols for scope three as part of their broader sustainability initiatives under their ESG or environmental social governance banner to meet the disclosure requirements of the sustainability reporting frameworks, such as the Carbon Disclosure Project or the Global Reporting Initiative. And recently the IFRS has come out with some additional reporting requirements under S1 and S2. And so the GHG protocol for scope three could help um, support some of those initiatives. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sindhu to see if we have any questions. Thank you. For anyone that would like to submit a question, you can use the uh, question uh, box here. Um, that's one of the options there. Just click in there and type it in, and I'll read it off to Stephanie. Thanks. Quiet group today. And that's okay if we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, if anything comes back up later, I can always um, write a written response and provide it um, to Sindhu. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I think your presentation was very informative, so I think you kind of hit every box that you could probably ask. So I think that's probably gonna be it for today, but thank you very much, Stephanie. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, Stephanie. It was an incredible presentation. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah, you do. Bye. Bye.